What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Uh, that was my attempt to be exciting. Um, today, we're going to talk about how to choose a travel camera, a camera for a vacation or a travel. And uh, I'm going to do it through like a kind of through my lens of my past experiences, the gear I have, where my mindset's at. And, and it's going to be roughly around like what I'm trying to do. But I suspect that many of you are facing this similar situation because I've talked to other people and we all kind of have a similar kind of thought process around uh, how to pick the right gear. And if you go on any kind of forums like DP Review, Rest in Peace, or whatever's next, um, you go on Fred Miranda forums, you see people talking about like, I have this camera, what lens setup? Or I have these cameras, which one should I bring? Or what's the most effective? And people talking about what they found to be the most impactful while they're on vacation. So I want to talk about that. And so uh, this is going to be a longer video, but uh, I'm going to tell you just real quickly what to expect. And you can kind of skip through if you want and give you kind of like the high level points. The first thing to talk about is my past experiences, what I've learned, what worked, what didn't work. Then I'm gonna talk about the trip that I'm going on and my expectations for that trip and what I kind of expect to be taking photos of, uh, cause that's important, right? You gotta kind of know what you're going to do. And then we're gonna talk about the cameras and the lenses that I currently own as of today, which I think is April 7th, is it? Or whatever day this is, um, April 7th. And then go through a couple different setups and the pros and cons and uh, walk through that. So without further ado, which is the buzzword to say on YouTube, let's talk about my past experiences. Okay, so last year I went on a trip in, to Punta Mita, Mexico, beautiful place on the Pacific side of Mexico at a Four Seasons Resort. The trip I'm going on in a couple weeks is the same thing. It's an award trip for top sales performers at my company. And so it's business people, it's my, uh, my fellow sales colleagues in a very beautiful place, but it's also like some cool things that we're doing in the area. And so last year when I went, I had the Nikon Z6 II. And at the time I had said, you know, it's really, really important for me, similar to what I'm going to say now, to have a small kit with great image quality. And so at that time, I took the 28 millimeter f2.8 pancake lens, and I also took the 40 millimeter f2 pancake lens. I think the 40 f2 is a great cheap lens. It's one of the gems in the modern lineup of Canon, Nikon, and Sony. Uh, it's kind of their cheap stuff, and I think it's fantastic. And so my experience last year with that was kind of, I wasn't satisfied with anything. Here's why. 28 was great to kind of like bop around and have that wide field of view. That was fine. That was all good. And 40 was good for a little bit better. And having f2 or f2.8 was fantastic because we had some night stuff going on where, you know, uh, there was like people dancing with flamethrowers and stuff, and that worked pretty well. But last year, I remember being frustrated because there was uh, some, some rocks out in the ocean with like waves hitting them and water splashing over it, and I really needed longer. I wish I had... 75 millimeter or 70 millimeter or maybe 100 millimeter, even 200 millimeters um, to try and make that work. And I missed some shots that I really, really liked. And on top of that, even though if you try to make the lenses small on, on a camera body, any camera body, I still had to carry it in a sling or carry it over my shoulder. And so what I realized is, is that if you really want to be pocketable and mobile, you got to be like a Ricoh GR type of thing where it's got to fit in your pocket. That was last year. Prior to that, I went to Florida and Disney World, and I brought with me a Ricoh GR3 and a Lumix S5. And what that trip told me was, man, I love the great image quality of a Lumix S5, but I didn't want to carry it around all the time. And I took more photos with the Ricoh GR3, but I often looked at them and said, well, I wish I would have had the full frame setup with the 1.8 or F2 glass, and could I have just taken some of these photos on my cell phone? Of course, APS-C is better than a cell phone, but you know, it, it makes you kind of a little bit of FOMO, if you will, of what could have been versus what actually happened. The great thing was, though, is that the Ricoh GR3 did live in my pant pocket, and I carried it with me everywhere, and I, it, was, it was great. Um, I like shooting a Ricoh GR-type camera way better than I do a cell phone, but in all reality, a cell phone probably could have taken a lot of images like that, and so I kind of was unsatisfied with the either-or scenario. That was prior to the trip last year that kind of got me thinking about that. Now, as you guys know, I recently purchased and got rid of the Olympus or OM Systems OM5 when I went to ski in Park City, Utah just a few months ago. And on that trip, I wanted something small, lightweight, compact, flip screen, IBIS, 
video everything rolled into a small package and because I didn't want the bigger lenses, I took the 12 to 45 F4 Pro. I wasn't going for shallow depth of field. I knew I'd be skiing. I needed more landscape. I wanted sharpness and image quality over having super shallow depth of field. Nighttime shooting wasn't really a concern for me. That was actually fantastic. It was weather sealed. It did everything. Like it's a one and done camera. The problem again there, similar to I mentioned on my trip last year uh, into Punta Mita with the Nikon Z6, is that I had to have it in a sling all the time or over my shoulder. And so there, you know, if you're going to carry a camera, carry a camera that gives you the ultimate image quality. Yes, it's a little bit lighter, but you're still carrying a camera with you. Um, and so I felt like, you know, what, was that the right trade-off to make? Now, outside of that, there was also the image quality issue, having, not an issue, but conversation, a micro four thirds. In the video you saw, I did post, I'm printing huge, there's a huge picture in my, my, my uh, living room in the hallway from micro four thirds, 20 megapixel sensor, cropped down to 12 megapixels. It looks fine. And so, you know, if you're gonna do something that doesn't require night shooting or shallow depth of field, or you're not going for that look, I really think when you go to print, especially that big, you don't need to have ultimate image quality necessarily. Again, if you're not shooting at night, and if you're not shooting uh, shallow depth of field, that micro four thirds lens with the F4 lens, uh, micro four thirds sensor with the F4 lens, it worked. Um, so there was that experience. And the last but not least, it's kind of like the X100V or XE3 pancake lens setup I've taken in the past. I found those kind of overall a, uh, they're great to carry around. They don't fit in your pant pocket. The image quality is good but you're stuck to a certain focal length. So like my trip last year where I wish I had 200 millimeters, you just can't, and you have to be okay with that. It's kind of like the Ricoh GR3, same thing. You get the portability, but you just can't in some instances. And for me, I just don't really love like mechanical uh, power zooms if you were to get something else like, let's say an Alex 100 Mark II. And so if you're okay with a locked off fixed focal length and you're just gonna be doing kind of documentary shooting, I think those can do a very good job. But for me, and I'll talk about this in the next segment, I suspect I'm gonna need more than just 35 millimeters. And so that's kind of the background and premise of different experiences for travel that I've had. And keep those in mind as I think about what the next part of this video is, talking about the trip itself. All right, so let's talk about the trip itself because I think if you wanna plan for what camera to bring, it is situational. For example, if you're going on a very photo specific trip, I think it makes sense to pack a big camera backpack and bring all the stuff because you're gonna be shooting you know, stars, you're gonna be shooting landscapes, portraits, whatever the, the trip is, I think it's important to be prepared for all that. For me, that's not the case. And like many of you, I suspect, this is kind of like a family vacation or a work slash trip that you wanna take photos on. And so you gotta kind of think about what the trip is. Now, let me tell you about my trip. And the point here is to kind of go through the similar logic of what things do you think I'm gonna encounter while I'm on this trip. So for me, day one is a travel day. We're flying out early at 6 a.m. in the morning, flying to Miami, layover, and taking a plane to St. Kitts. And from St. Kitts, we're taking a boat, well, a car, to a boat, and then a boat to Nevis, the island that's next to it. You can't fly direct into Nevis with a commercial airline. So in that section alone, I kind of suspect that there's going to be some culture and, and some different things we'll see as we arrive, as we're driving to the port to get on the boat, and then of course on the boat ride, there's gonna be a bunch of stuff to take pictures of. And so from that perspective, I'm gonna need something that's more documentary style. I don't think I'll need telephoto, but I think anywhere from like 24 millimeters to 75 millimeters is gonna to be totally fine. So in that case, probably a 24 to 75 type lens. From there, it's kind of like a welcome reception, getting our accommodations, relax, say hi to people, hang out, mingle, and that kind of stuff. And it's that mingle part that brings me back to a Ricoh GR3 or X100V type style camera because as you're mingling, do you really want a big camera over your shoulder? That's something to consider and something to think about. So now day two. Day two, we're gonna be getting up. We're gonna have, I think, the morning to ourselves, breakfast, leisure. We're at the Four Seasons on Nevis. Usually that breakfast in a beautiful spot. I remember last year when we were in Punta Mita, like there was beautiful views. And I think there's stuff to be captured there. Even the lobby itself at Punta Mita, where we are at that Four Seasons was beautiful. So. There's probably stuff as we walk around and have the morning. My wife and I might get up, might walk around, grab a sunrise, grab a coffee, and just enjoy time together without the kids and, you know, do that husband and wife thing. 
And so from that perspective, I think having a camera on my shoulder, I want to take photos and grab some sunrises and stuff. Is she, she's okay with me doing that because I think now that we got something on the wall at home, she likes the fact that some of these pictures can be used as art in our house. After we get up in the morning, we're going to be going on a Jeep tour of the island. So all over the island, checking out different things. And to me, this is the prime photography portion of the trip. We're going to be in a Jeep, seeing different buildings, going to the tip of that and the bottom of this and it's different, who knows, right? And so from that perspective, there's a lot going on. So I think I want to be prepared for, for photos that I might take there. Day three, um, again, a bit more leisure. And we're going to be doing some rum tasting, uh, going to kind of understand the history of Nevis and tasting some of the rum that they make on the island. Again, I think that's going to be more of like landscape slash documentary shots. And I should say, my goal with this trip is to tell a story with some video, tell a story with my photos, and try and capture the people, the culture, and the places that we go to. And that's what I'm trying to do. Day four is a day at leisure. So there's sunrise or sunset opportunities there. Um, we might book something, maybe a spa day, or we might go on a hike, I don't know. But there might be more opportunity for photos that day, and then day five, we return home. And so if you think about in general, there's a wide variety there. I want to be able to have my camera with me for times that I'm with other people, but I don't want it to be obtrusive. But at the same time, I want to be able to capture all the stuff we might do on the Jeep tour and the rum tasting, sunrise, sunset, all that kind of stuff. And so now that you understand what I'm going to be doing in a couple of weeks, we should talk about the gear that I have and kind of how I see each one fitting. If you're thinking about taking an adventure, trip, whatever with the camera, you should plot out kind of what you're doing, what you might encounter as well. I think it's a good thing. All right, now on to the gear part of the video because would this even be my channel if I didn't have gear? Uh, we're gonna have to switch cameras around because the camera I'm filming you on plays a role and I wanna show it to you. So we're gonna bop back and forth between those different things. But let's start with the Fuji setup. Uh, actually, let's back up and let's start with where my mind's at based on past experiences. I know that I don't want to be carrying a backpack full of stuff. That gets annoying. I also know I don't want to be single threaded into just one focal length. I think I need something wide and something kind of like on the longer end of standard or more telephoto. So let's start with the Fuji setup. As you guys know, I have the Fuji X-T5, this guy right here. Now I've sold a lot of the lenses since I've made the last video. And the only lenses I have left are the 27 millimeter f2.8 that you see right here on the camera as I'm showing you this. And then also the 55 millimeter, uh, 55 to 200 telephoto lens. Now, what I like about this is it kind of fits my requirement of fitting into a three liter sling. That's right, that's something else I put in there is that I know I don't want to carry a six liter sling, it's too big, I don't want to carry a camera backpack. And so everything that I do needs to fit into this bag right here. This is the Peak Design 3 liter. I really like this bag. I've skied with it in the last two trips. I slung it over my shoulder, put my keys, my wallet, whatever in here, and it was just compact. And I didn't feel like a total doofus as I carried this around. This camera setup, this X-T5 with the 27, it fits in here no problem. As you can see, I've got the X-T5 and the 55 to 200 with the 27 f2.8 on here. So this fits the requirement. And the beauty of this is that the X-T5 is good at video. The X-T5 is good at straight out of camera colors. The X-T5 is pretty small, lightweight, and tiny with this 27 millimeter f2.8 on it. And of course I have the 55 to 200 in case there's that shot like I had last year with rocks out in the ocean and or if there's something more landscape where I need to get in. You know, if you watch Andy Mumford or any of these other guys or even Thomas Heaton, you see that they shoot landscapes with these longer lenses. And so this is a really, really good option. But the downside with this potential option is, well, the reality is I won't be using the 55 to 200 outside of just some specialty use cases. So that leaves me with just the 27 2.8 to do most of my shooting. And that's okay. This lens is really, really sharp and I like the images that come out of it. Um, the 40 millimeter equivalent focal length is actually really, really good, but it does leave some to be desired on the wide end. Now a way to kind of approach that wide end shortcoming is to do stitch panels. If I had to do something like that, we could do a stitch panel for sure if I had to do something wider. Um, and of course, this doesn't really help me on the shallow depth of field department. 27 millimeter f2.8, it's kind of like a Ricoh GR3X, right? Where, where it's a 40 millimeter equivalent and um, it's okay. 
but it's 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 not perfect. And this lens also is not great for video. It it can do it, but it focuses. It's the old school like focus moding focus motors, and so uh, when you put it in video, it kind of has a jerky effect to the focusing. And so that's some of the cons to the XT5. But otherwise, this is a fantastic setup. Small light portable over the shoulder, unobtrusive, can do most things I need probably, or a good chunk of them. And then of course I have the telephoto option. But the bad side is changing lenses. And changing lenses can be annoying because if I could, if I could, I would like to have just the camera on me for most of the trip and not have to carry a bag if I had, had it my way. I know it kind of sounds like I contradicted myself, but you know, having to change lenses and always having to have the bag on me, eh, I don't know. I guess that's not necessarily the case, but you see my point. I mean, you're stuck to 27 and I'm married to it, or that's it. So that's option one. That is the Fuji setup. All right, so let's talk about the Leica SL2S setup. Now, many of you might have noticed my last video of this camera is back in my possession, and it is. And I got to tell you the stuff I have with it. First, I have the SL2S, obviously. Uh, it's right here. And then I have the 50 millimeter F2 SL Sumicron, which is basically a Lumix 51.8 rebadge, but it's a very nice lens. I also have the Sigma 24 millimeter F2 lens. I really like these lenses because uh, it gives me the aperture ring um, and then the two control dials on the SL2S give me exposure triangle at my fingertips, all metal, really well built, great image quality, autofocus, manual focus switch, they're good. And then this lens is the 90 millimeter Sigma F 2.8 DGDN, another great small lens that uh, gives me some reach. And so thinking of a prime setup, I could put, let me put this on here. I could do something where I throw the Leica SL2S and the 24 in here. And then there's just enough room to either throw in the 50 F2 right here, which it barely fits by the way, it does fit. Or I could throw in the 90 f2.8, but then it leaves a big gap right between 24 and 90. That means most of my photos would be shot at 24. They both kind of fit in there. Or I could adapt my M mount Sumicron lens right here. And that fits in there much nicely. The point is this three liter bag has enough for the Leica SL2S in two primes, 24 and 50, which should be good. 24 and 90, 50 and 90, some combination. But similar to the Fuji setup, it leaves a couple issues. One, I'm changing lenses between primes. And so if I want to shoot wide to go to something more compressed, I had to switch lenses, bring the bat. It's just kind of, it's kind of cumbersome. And that's the downside of it. Another downside is that it's like SL2S. If you're doing something we're doing now, just locked off, it can do the video and we'll switch to this camera in just a second. But for like tracking and video autofocus, it's not good in video. Photos, it's just fine. In, in video for tracking autofocus, it's not good. So you have to make sure you kind of manage it from behind it. Also, this camera is a little bit bigger than the X-T5, quite a bit bigger. But back to my point earlier in the video where if you're gonna carry this, you can carry this because neither of them fit in your pocket. You have to throw them in a the sling or throw them over your shoulder. So in reality, yes, the SL2S is bigger, but you're still carrying a camera no matter what. So it's something to kind of think about. Now, the benefit to this obviously is image quality. It's a full frame sensor and uh, you have the F2 lenses on there and it, it's gonna be my best overall package or option to bring with it for the SL. There's one other option though for the Leica SL that I wanna share with you guys. Let me change the lens real quick. And that is the last lens that I have for the Leica SL2S and that is the 28 to 70 lens F2.8 from Sigma. This lens is great um, in terms of overall image quality. It gives me 28 on the wide end, which is great. It gives me 70 on the long end. Um, of course, like any of these cameras, I can go in APS-C crop mode, or at least this camera, so I can get a little more reach out of them. Um, and this is kind of the one and done setup. In reality, I could not bring a camera bag at all. I might still do that, but I could not bring a camera bag. I could sling this over my shoulder and just walk around with it and be good. Now, 70 millimeters maybe isn't as long as I wish. It doesn't certainly cover that same focal range as the 55 to 200 like the Fuji does, but I think this will end up being a specialty lens. And so is it worth it? This is kind of the one and done setup. It's the SL2S with the 28 to 70 on it um, as, the last, as the one to final setup. So that's another option. 
this, just like the other one, fits in my three liter sling, no problem, perfectly. No need for anything else. So this is a good, this is a good option as well. And then last and not least, let's go to the setup that's filming me right now. And I'll talk about the benefits of that. But in order to do that, I need to switch over. And I think I'm going to switch over to the SL2S. God help us. And maybe I'll use the 24F2 Sigma lens. All right. Last but not least, and by the way, we switched over to the Leica SL2S with the Sigma 24F2. The camera's atrocious at video autofocus tracking, but if you're standing locked off, hopefully this is okay and proves my point. But the last option that we have here is this Lumix GH6. I haven't talked about this on the channel. I picked it up for an absolute steal. Maybe I'll talk about it in a future video. But this has the 12 to 60 f2.8 to f4 Leica lens on it. And this is also a great option. Um, it's a one and done setup, kind of like the SL2S is with the 28 to 70, except it gives me more reach. Just gives me up to 120 millimeter equivalent reach. The autofocus on this camera is better than the Leica SL2S, uh, specifically in video. The stabilization is better, specifically in video. Um, it has more controls that are sometimes easier to access uh, a bit. And if, did I say the stabilization is better? And it has a tilting screen, so I can do a flip screen, I can see myself for video. It also can do this tilty thing right here. And so overall, this has a bit more feature functionality than the SL2S, at least at your fingertips. Um, it's weather sealed. But the problem with this is, is that when you compare it to the SL2S, and I'm holding it up right here, this is actually almost the same size. It's not very much different at all. The smallest camera of the three is the X-T5 for sure by a long shot. And so you're carrying around almost the same weight and size as the SL2S, but you're giving up the sensor performance. Um, all three of these cameras have a multi-shot mode for high res, so I'm not really con concerned about that if I get a chance to do it. Although the X-T5 requires you to stitch it in post. I think the GH6 and the SL2S can do it in camera. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure. Um, but again, this offers something totally different. Better stabe, better autofocus, a one-done package with more reach, uh, but you're giving up the sensor and you're not really gaining on the size. And so for me, you know, I, I was tempted to bring this, but I, I think... I think it'd be a tough sell compared to the X-T5 and the SL2S, even given the different benefits it offers over the two. Um, but this camera's fantastic. I mean, I didn't expect to like it very much, and I'm really enjoying this camera. It's built very pro. It's done a good job. The video you watched before, this chunk was on the GH6, shot in V-Log, graded with the Panasonic LUT, um, whereas this is the SL2S, shot in L-Log, graded with the Leica LUT. Uh, but in any case, this is a great camera, and it, if I didn't get the deal I got on it, I probably wouldn't pay the money for it, but I got a smoking deal on it. And it's still in the trial period, so we'll see how it does. But it's a great camera. Um, so this is my other option. It's a one and done combination. It also, similarly, as you might expect, fits in the three liter bag, absolutely no problem. And so those are the three options I have available to me with my camera current setup. Uh, okay, let's switch back to the GH6 now. All right, so you've seen my options, you know the trip I'm going on, kind of set the stage. Let's talk about other options I don't have. Like if I were to go spring and buy something last minute, things I've thought of, kind of going more down the portability size and capability. Now there's this like crazy idea, let's call it option one, if you will, of the GR3 plus a GR3X. It gives me 28, gives me 40, they both fit in my pocket. It is two cameras, but they're the same. And so if I want, I can just leave one behind and I can just carry around two APS-C cameras. And that'd be fantastic. A second option is something like the LX100 Mark II or a, a Leica Delux, which has a 24 to 70, I think it was f1.7 to 28 zoom lens on a micro four third sensor, although it's slightly cropped for the multi aspect ratio. Um, that's okay as well. I mean, it, it gives you portability. It's not super pocketable, but you're kind of back to the micro four thirds thing and, and it's okay. I, I don't know, it's just, it's not ultimate image quality, but it could work. I have a little pocket flash for the LX100 Mark II. I've owned it in the past, so I could add a flash to it. Similarly, I could add a flash to the Fuji. I forgot to mention that in the past. So that's an option. Another one I thought about was the Q2. That's actually why I rented the Q2 a long time ago, is to see how would I get along with it. And I kind of, you know, the image quality is fantastic. It's a full frame sensor. It's a great lens on there, uh, even with some software corrections. But I felt like 28 would be too limiting. I know people said the crop modes. I didn't really buy into it. I get it, it can work in a pinch for sure. 
I just think 28 might be too limited. The benefit of that is kind of like the X100V or any kind of XE3 with the pancake lens on it. If you commit to one focal length, you kind of have that similar look to everything and you don't have to think much about what you're doing. You just kind of go out and you shoot and if you're outside of that range, you're outside that range. The negative is, is you end up like last year where I've thought about that shot forever because I could have had a truly portfolio, if you will, worthy, not that I have a portfolio, portfolio worthy shot, um, which would be really, really cool. So in the end, what am I leaning towards? Right now, I'm leaning towards the Leica SL2S with the 28 to 70. I get ultimate image quality. I get a 28 on the wide end, which is enough for me, 70 on the long end, and then I can go into APS-C mode to get a total of 105 millimeters of reach if I had to. Yes, I'm giving up megapixels, but as you tell from that picture on my wall, I probably do enough with those megapixels that are remaining. Let's call it, what, 12 megapixels? I don't know. It is big, it is bulky, but the burden of carrying that around versus the GH6, it's the same. Even carrying it around versus the X-T5, uh, yes, the X-T5 is lighter, but it's it's uh, still a camera you have to carry around. Um, from the video aspect, it does suck at autofocus tracking and video, but I'm going to be behind it. And the way I've kind of managed it is that on the, GA, on the SL2S, the joystick, you push it in, you can kind of pump it to focus, and you kind of locked off. And the, fo the video I'm trying to take is not vlog style like this. It's more like scenic stuff to inject between photos. I want to capture the feel and the sounds and the look in video on the SL2S of the scene that we're in, not necessarily me talking to a camera, trying to work that out for you guys. If I had to, I would just use my iPhone to kind of do a self-recording, or maybe I'll bring the GoPro um, and slide it in the side pocket. It is very small. So that's my option. I won't lie though, it is tempting to kind of just take this X-T5 and almost have an X100V style camera with me and just focus on one focal length, give myself that very uh, you know um, uh, consistent look in my photos, has good video, has good stabilization, good autofocus, uh, great out-of-camera colors, and then grabbing the telephoto for the few times that I need it and just simplifying that way because this is so much smaller over the SL2S. But like I said, you still have to carry it. Like if I'm going to go to an event with my coworkers, this will still be on my shoulder or still going to be in a sling bag. So the commitment to carry is still the same. So I think right now, as I sit today, I am SL2S with the 28 to 70 is option A. The X-T5 is option B. And then uh, the SL2S plus primes is like C, D, GH6 is C, D. I don't know. So um, hopefully this helped you guys. If you want to kind of input way into what kit you think I should bring, given what I've got now, comment section below. That'd be fantastic. And if this helped you kind of decide how to do it, right? Like look at your, look at your gear, look at the scenario you're going to be in. Think about the actual commitment to carry camera around and what you're going to be taking photos of and if it's worth it. I've bumped my head up against this topic forever and it's kind of like the kiss of death. This causes gas for me big time because I always want to buy something else to fit what I think I need for that trip. And what I end up finding out is simple is usually the answer. That's typically the answer. Size, if you can make it happen in simplicity, is the answer. All right, this was a long video. If you watched it all the way, thank you. I'll see you guys in the comment section below. I appreciate it. I'll catch you on the next one.